then I'm do the live stream. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. Cavanis HR focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Joey Price. Joey, are you ready to be great today? Hey, Joey, can you hear me? Joey. Yes. Hey, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be great, man. Let's be great on purpose. Joey Price is a CEO, HR consultant, leadership coach, and speaker. Joey is an award-winning HR executive, business coach, thought leader, and professor. He is a founder of Jumpstart HR, an HR consulting practice specifically for small businesses and startups, and host of the Business Life and Coffee podcast, a weekly and professional development podcast. As a CEO of Jumpstart HR, Joey innovates by creating HR solutions for small business owners and startup founders who want to build better, more competitive businesses. As a podcaster on the Business Life and Coffee show, he shares carefully curated conversations on personal finance, psychology, professional development and businesses for emerging, and, and emerging professionals and business owners alike. Joey, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me, man. So first, um, I want to publicly thank Joey, and he probably doesn't remember this. A few years ago, when I started, I had the idea about starting Kevin's HR. Joey's one of the people I reach out to about doing Kevin's HR. He actually called me on my phone and, and talked me through it, right? Because I'm like, man, all, everyone's doing HR, everyone's doing the same thing. And Joey, like, no, Jason, actually, you're doing something different. You should, you know, give it a try, right? So I just want to, you know, publicly thank Joey for, you know, influencing me to do, to, to, to do Kevin's HR. I, it's an honor, man. I remember that conversation and, uh, you're still doing something special. So keep going, keep going at it. Keep building. I, I said earlier offline, you know, you're, you're building a empire over there. So I'm proud of you, man. I, I like, I like the, the stuff that you're doing. Thanks. Joey. So day, today is a uh, June 19th, Juneteenth, which has been a lot of news. Like personally, like I'm from Texas. So I, I know what Juneteenth is going up in Texas. So it's kind of surprising to me how many people did not know what Juneteenth was across the nation until, you know, recent events. Can you yeah. talk some about, about Juneteenth and the importance of it? Sure. Yeah. So, and uh, what part of Texas are you from? So I, I was born in a town called Kerrville by San Antonio. Okay. So I grew up in central Texas, the hill country in the seventh grade. We moved to Odessa, Texas, my seventh grade here in West Texas. Oh man. I, I would, I was born in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. My dad was in the air force. So we didn't stay there long. But I always say I'm a true Texan because at least I was born there. Yeah, that's and, all it uh, takes. That, yeah, that's all it takes. So my birthright is in is in Texas. But uh, Juneteenth is uh, it's definitely a Texas holiday because that's where the uh, Union General actually had to bring troops into the Confederate ter territory of Texas to say, "Hey, uh, we freed the slaves two and a half years ago." Why are you all still having slaves and doing slave labor? So uh, we as black people celebrate June 10th. Um, there's emotions on, on either side. So celebrate, remember, reflect. You know, it's not necessarily, you're not excited that freedom was delayed, but you do champion the fact that freedom happened in the, in the first place. Uh, but it was, it's a day that we remember where the last of the slaves were set free. And it was two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Declaration, or sorry, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. So, Joey, recently there's been a lot of, a lot of companies like giving the people and you know, making Juneteenth a, a, a holiday for the company. Do you think they're doing this because the place, their heart's in the right place, or they're being disingenuous, or what do you, what's your take on that? You know, I'm sure there is a percentage of folks who are making these decisions kind of based on their gut and. Um, they don't really grasp the true meaning of what it means to celebrate Juneteenth. Uh, but I can only judge people by their actions moving forward. You know, so it, it's as much as it's about uh, giving people a day off, a day of remembrance, um, which Jumpstart HR, we've done today as well. But it's also about what are the things that you're doing in your organization to erase uh, systemic racism and be on the right side of history and humanity. So time will tell my friend, but I'm sure there's a few folks just 
capitalizing on the day. I even saw I even saw a Juneteenth sale, and I'm like, oh, we're we're already there with the uh, the economics of it. People are um, trying to capitalize on on Juneteenth as a as a uh, a sales holiday. Joey, why did you make HR your career? Well, uh, the long and short of it is I, I went to college for something other than HR. And I, I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life when I was studying. And uh, I had an opportunity to do some temp jobs during the summer in college. You know, while my friends were wearing Hawaiian shirts at the, at the local amusement park selling smoothies, I got to uh, work in downtown D.C., uh, in different corporate arenas and nonprofit uh, jobs. And I had this uh, itch to work in corporate, but I wanted to help people. I didn't want my days to be the same. And uh, a few people I know, I sat down and talked with them and they said, you should do HR. And that's exactly what I did. So uh, I, my first job out of college was an HR assistant. And I studied a lot about what HR means. I did a whole bunch of conversations, coffee conversations about, um, you know, mentorship and things like that. And it, it, it was something that I grasped and I fell in love with. And uh, year after year, milestone after milestone, I continue to see that this is definitely the sweet spot that I'm supposed to be in. And so I'm just super excited to, to be in the profession. And how long have you been doing HR? Ooh, I have been in HR I graduated in 2008, so uh, 12 years. 12 years. And what made you become an entrepreneur and start your own HR company? Yeah, in college, I managed a band. I managed and played in a band. And I uh, liked the entrepreneurial aspect of it, being able to uh, control your time, control how much you make, uh, be able to grow with a group of people um, that you choose. And um, I, I didn't start my corporate life expecting to be an entrepreneur, but it just kind of happened where I saw some things at the places that I was working along the way and said, you know, if I had my own company, I would do things a little bit differently. Uh, more specifically, uh, I saw HR was pr purely an administrative function. You know, we were there just to collect paperwork, put things in Excel spreadsheet, make sure new hires had their enrollment benefits call the benefits people and all of that stuff is still important in HR. But the more I got involved in, um, you know, my local SHRM chapter and met people and attended conferences, I saw that, you know, small business HR should be done differently. And so uh, in the midst of our last recession, I said, let me go and start a company. I was pretty, pretty either brave or stupid back then. Uh, who knows? And I, I just told myself, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back and get a job. And um, that was nine years ago. And here we are still, still making an impact for businesses across the country. And so I want to talk about something real quick. And this is my opinion. So I think in HR today, there's the HR of old, HR of no, and the HR of yes, HR of new, right? HR old is like, you know, um, hey, HR person, what's going on in marketing? I don't know. I don't work in marketing. That's not my business, right? Or, hey, HR person, this person needs to talk to you. They can't get you until 530. Well, I got four for five, I'm leaving at five, you know, or, hey, HR person, I got this great way to increase profitability and RI. Well, I'm not doing that because it's extra work, right? Mm -hmm. And then the HR knew is like direct opposite, right? And also HR knows everything is black and white, you know, if it says this way, we got to do it right. HR, the HR, yes, HR knew is like, you know, they know everything going on in the company. They know what's going on. They're opening new ideas. Um, how do we get from the HR old, HR new, right? Or does it just matter these old people? Not, not, and it's not based on age, right? It's based on their ideas and where they yeah. think. It's just a matter of those people like retiring and going away, so to speak, and the new blood coming in, or how do you think we get past that? Well, you know, I, I think we do a disservice to our industry as a whole when we hold on to some old uh, limiting beliefs um, because whether HR likes to or not, or likes it or not, the world of business has evolved so much in the past 10 years, so much in the past five years. And now with COVID and uh, with the, uh, the wokeness of society, so much in the past five weeks. And so if we're going to um, want to be competitive and want to be one of those business functions that 
uh, are relevant, are real, and, and, and make a difference, we have to uh, realize that the world is changing around us and we need to be on the, on the solution side of things. So how do we, how do we uh, address old mindsets? Um, I'm not the kind of person who's going to say, you know, every, every person that's been in HR for the past 30 years needs to retire because you, you do things the old way. But I would just encourage people to look at how they're doing HR and challenge themselves to not only grow for the sake of their career, but grow for the sake of their business. Um, your, your businesses are depending on you to, to lead your people well, make good people decisions, and um, add value on a day-to-day -day basis. That's uh, administrative, yes, but strategically and uh, from a technology perspective as well. I know everyone talks about millennials being like tech savvy, but I think Generation Z is taking tech to like a whole different level, right? I mean, oh, yeah. Generation Z, they do everything on the phone, right, or mobile. And I think if you're an HR department and you're having people apply to your to jobs like online or like websites, you have to be, do, go to cell phone mobile get more advanced. You know? And I think a lot of HR people are fighting that. I mean, just my opinion. What, what, you, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, it, it's, it, th there's a fight against technology because we're so afraid of technology. You have to look at technology as uh, allowing you to scale your ability to do what you're good at and to do things that um, may require more of your time. It's not so much that uh, technology, especially in the HR tech space, is meant to replace your job. A perfect example or a way that I look at it is like, you know, let's say somebody wants to lose weight, right? Well, you can hire a trainer or you can get a treadmill, but if you don't know how to use that treadmill, you're still going to need a coach to help you get the most out of your, your fitness, your health, your diet, all that sort of stuff. And, and we use technology to our benefit because it's not there to replace the trainer. It's there so that the trainer can add more value to the person that has the fitness goals. So it's similar in business. HR tech is meant to um, increase capacity, increase scale, reduce errors um, and, and give you more time to focus on some of those strategic things that simply robots can't, can't handle yet. And the people side of things that, that robots will never handle. You're not going to shake hands with a robot. You're not going to, um, you know, a robot's not going to call and say, Hey, how are you doing in the midst of COVID? Press one. If you're doing great, press two, if you're not doing great, right. That's a problem that people will need to solve from here until eternity. So speaking of HR tech, you know, there's so many HR tech that are they're trying to solve recruiting, employee engagement. It's like, I mean, like here in Seattle, I can think of eight HR tech, H, H, HR tech companies trying to solve recruiting, right? Just in Seattle, eight alone, right? Yep. But despite all these HR, HR tech companies trying to prove HR, HR still has a, like this legacy background, right? Traditional background. That's, and it's not like there's like a, and I miss it, right? Like how do we get away from this legacy and traditional HR and like, no, we are actually like one of the, you know, we are tech savvy, right? We do want to solve problems using, you know, advanced methods versus, you know, who's, you know, spreading, pulling out the spreadsheet, you know, again. Yeah. Well, there's an old saying that um, if you are a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And what that means is if you are a spreadsheet driven HR professional, every problem you think is going to be solved by putting something in your spreadsheet. That's not the case anymore. That's not going to be what allows us to be successful in our, in our profession. And so I would encourage you to even start with like listening to listening and be opening open for ideas, you know, things like listening to your podcast, Jason, listen to mine. Uh, there's a few other great HR tech podcasters out there. Uh, you know, read publications, go to conferences or webinars and see what ways people are solving problems that you have and see what ways technology is solving problems. Um, I was recently um, recognized, I guess, for the past two years now as one of the top 100 influencers in HR tech uh, by HR Executive Magazine. And one of the things that I do to stay on top of you know, the space is to get out and attend conferences and talk with people have coffee conversations and say, hey, where are you seeing the field? Where is it going? What books should I be reading? What pods should I be listening to? And the more you expose yourself to diverse voices, the more you'll realize that every problem is not a nail 
or uh, solvable by spreadsheet. So Joe, last time when I reached out to potential customers, you know, the reply is, well, we're not hiring or we don't, we don't need recruiting or we don't need benefits. Right. It's like, like niche. Can you talk some about how expensive HR really is? I don't think people really appreciate everything HR involves. Yeah. Well, so, um, HR is expensive either way. It's expensive if it's good and it's expensive if you're not doing it well. Um, so I'll talk about how expensive bad HR is first. The uh, it, uh, bad HR is expensive because you're going to realize that A, you're not going to attract the best people for your organization because you're not aligning your goals with the kind of people that can um, come in and, and solve your problems. You might be hiring because maybe the person went to your same school or maybe because you know them, even if you don't know they can do the job or, you know, you just post and pray and, and uh, put something on a job board and thought, oh, well, I think their resume looks good. Let's, let's hire them. So if you have bad people working in your organization, it's only a matter of time before those, ex those expensive accidents and misfires add up. Um, another reason why bad HR is expensive is because if you don't know policies that you should be uh, aware of, and if you don't know of employee rights and responsibilities and employer rights and responsibilities, when it comes time to things like paid off, uh, or sorry, um, paid time off, um, sick leave, last paycheck laws, uh, data retention, all those sorts of things, that can result in fines and fees. Um, so it could be super Im, uh, important to make sure you're doing HR good. Now, good HR is expensive, but there's a return on it. Um, when you invest in proper benefits for your employees, uh, you're going to see that there, there's higher engagement. There's going to be better retention. When you're paying employees fairly, you're going to see that they stick around more and that they contribute um, to, a, to a higher degree. When you focus on things like um, uh, performance improvement, when you focus on employee coaching, when you focus on training and development, all these sorts of things, you have to look at them as investments in your business as opposed to uh, cutting a check that, that has no return. You're, you're literally increasing the value of your organization when you invest in your people. One thing I know people, a lot of people don't realize is HR is probably the only business function that function that touches every employee each up their weight, right? From recruiting yeah. to like retirement. I mean, HR is doing something through the life cycle of the employee. Yeah. I laugh sometimes when people in HR, uh, it happens at conferences a lot, but they'll say, we need to get a seat at the table. I hate and I'm that. like, it, HR has hired everybody that sits at the table. Like you, you are the table gatherer. Like, it, it, I don't know. It's stupid, but yeah, um, that yeah. crazy too. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. But no, HR touches everybody in the organization from from the CEO to the customer. HR has a role in, uh, in even from the board of advisors to the customer. Um, HR has a role in everything. I did a blog post a few years ago about that, you know, the seat at the table, like, you know, how they drive me crazy. It's like, sit at the table yourself, right? Like, what are you waiting for? Like, uh, no one else asks, like, if you're the, in marketing or sales or business, whatever operations, they're not asking, oh, can I be invited to the table, right? It's like, HR is the only function that does that. It drives me that crazy. Yeah, I don't know what it is, man, but I'm glad that we're uh, turning the conversation away from that. Um, I, I still think HR is, is in the midst of this identity crisis. Uh, and I think we've been here for a while, but I believe and I'm confident that um, the voices that are rising up to the top, uh, some of the speakers and podcasters and influencers uh, that are trusted by the business community will help uh, articulate the value that HR brings to an organization. So let's talk about cultural fast. So I'm in the opinion that there's no such thing as a good or bad culture. It's a culture that's right for your company. And example I was used here in the Seattle area, there's Amazon and Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. you, you work at Amazon, you expect to do something for 30 days. You better be grinding, you know, make, make, make an impact immediately. Starbucks, you know, first 30 days, you're meeting people, collaborating, not really doing anything right. So if you're in Starbucks and go to Amazon and Amazon or Starbucks and keep the same culture, you're going to feel all right. Because you haven't, you know, yeah, somebody does things differently. How important is culture to success of a business? How can CEOs in, in improve this? 
Well, you know, I'll I'll argue that there is good and bad culture, but I would say that it's good and bad for your organization um, because in any in any organization, you will find that uh, a- attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs are either approved and and um, celebrated. Or they are uh, they're they're um, looked down upon and disciplined, and so you create your organic culture based on what you approve and what you disapprove of. So if you want things to go well, if you want employees excited um, and ready to work in your business, whatever that may be, you have to figure out the right attitude, behaviors, and beliefs to promote, as opposed to the wrong ones. You know, in, in Amazon, they're gonna um, have certain attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that they approve. And like you said, Starbucks is going to be different. But uh, I like, I like my friend, Tim Sackett, who uses uh, the term money ball, which is from, from baseball. And it says, you know, there's no such thing as like getting the ideal player or the, like the best player rather, but you want to find the, the best player for your organization. Like you want to find the best player for uh, the customers that you interact interact with you want to find the best player for the managers that you have on your team you want to find the best player for you know the goals that you're trying to accomplish and when you think of you know your organization as custom then you start to have uh, conversations of well what's the custom culture that we're trying to build next let's talk about hr data or hr analytics i mean it drives me crazy you have hr people that you know i don't do numbers i don't do data I'm like well then you're probably not doing hr right <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's true. Um, there is still and will always be a, a human, empathetic, soft side to HR. Uh, I do believe that that's always going to be important to HR. But then I also believe that as humans, we should have that in all areas of, of business. But um, to our point earlier about moving forward um, and business evolving, a lot of decisions these days are made by data. And um, if you are not on the, on the uh, right side of that conversation, you're doing your uh, organization a disservice. So if you look at you know, metrics on a dashboard and say, okay, well, this is, these are leading indicators of X and these are lag- lagging indicators of Y. Uh, we need to recalibrate based on this and, and move forward. Then... I mean, what strategic value are you adding to your organization? Um, that, that, that goes for employees that are in HR as well as consultants that um, support businesses. So Joey, next I want to talk about a pet peeve of mine and, um, and get your opinion. So, all right. And, and, and so we'll focus on HR, but it's like H, there's a lot of people say they're HR experts, but also people that say they're, I'm a social media expert, I'm a marketing expert, you know, fill in the blank expert, right? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you're saying you're an HR expert, but you on LinkedIn profile, you've been an HR person for two years, right? Yeah. And, and even like, even if you're, you're a VP of HR for, we'll say a manufacturing company in Tennessee for 25 years. Okay, you might be an expert on HR in your company, but there's no way you can convince me you're, you're an HR expert in everything, right? Every single law, every single locality, on benefits, everything, right? Like, I yeah. just won't get it. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some HR experts, HR leaders out there, you know, but it's, I just think too many people throw it around. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you've um, you're you're right, and we are so quick to um, anoint ourselves as experts, as thought leaders, as influencers, without really understanding what that means. And so, I would say a true definition of an HR expert is someone who has the ability to um, understand a business problem and then apply it to multiple different contexts. So to your point of, you know, the manufacturing HR pro in Tennessee, yeah, uh, you may be a really good specialist, but the expert level is if I give you the same problem and you can adapt it to manufacturing in California where labor laws are different and you know to do that. Or if you take, um, you know, a problem that may happen in a manufacturing setting in Tennessee and you apply it to uh, healthcare in New York, you know, um, it's your ability to adapt wisdom to um, certain scenarios 
and uh, to deliver value time and time again, that makes you an expert. Like if I dribble the ball for two years, I'm not an expert like Michael Jordan, right? Uh, because if, if, if I dribble the ball against my homies, like that's one thing. But if I dribble the ball against, uh, you know, LeBron James or Chris Paul or, uh, you know, all those folks that are in the league, my relative expertise, quote unquote, is going to get found out really, really quickly. So expertise, uh, influencers, thought leaders, should be able to, um, you know, do, do their craft at the highest level. Um, you should be able to do your craft at the highest level, whether you work for small companies or large companies. And just for the record, in my opinion, Joey Price is one of our HR experts, HR leaders and thought leaders. So I just want to put that out there. Joey Price is one of those people, in my opinion. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I appreciate you. You know, I, I just really love, I just really love HR and, um, you know, you asked me earlier about why did I get into it? And now I don't know what I would be doing, you know, if, if I weren't in HR. So I really do feel like I've uh, had this, this, this love affair with the profession and all it can mean for not only my own career, but like the, the difference that I want to make in the world. So I'm just out here trying to learn and grow every day. Yes. Joey, next, talk about the importance of being on social media, both as an entrepreneur and HR in general, or just in, being on social media in general in this day and age for your employer brand, personal brand, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's super important. Um, you want to be on social media. Let's, let's, let's take that in the phases, right? So as a professional, you want to be on social media because so much news and thought leadership, uh, the right thought leadership, uh, happens on uh, on social media. So, for example, you have a front row seat to uh, Twitter conversations at the highest level of people who have been leaders and pioneers in the space for a long time. Um, you can see what other people are talking about in various areas if you hop on LinkedIn and you're in groups and you're seeing what topics bubble up to the top as important. You know, even now, uh, Jason, I've I've dabbled in. Um, I, I consume on sites like Quora and Reddit because those are some of the under underappreciated social media sites, but there's a lot of smart people there and um, you can learn a lot uh, just by listening there. And then um, as a profession, you can, you can contribute to the organization. You can contribute to the conversation too. Like you can write blogs, you can get on video, you can do podcasts casting like Jason and I and um, you can you can become someone who is a voice that people listen to uh, as an entrepreneur it's a great way to display your expertise uh, it's a great way for people to uh, figure out what you're all about get to know you um, you know uh, John Jantz would say you know there's a process where people uh, like you try you and then buy you and so the podcasting and social media is where people can like you and try your expertise as well before they commit to buy. And um, uh, I don't think you brought up this category, but like students, you know, if you're looking to get a job or you're looking to figure out if HR is the right thing for you, hop on social media and see, you know, if these are the conversations that pique your interest and you can figure out where within HR you want to, um, you, you want to be. So Joe, it seems like Twitter is like the social media platform where HR professionals go to engage each other. I mean, why yeah, Twitter? Why, so. why, why Twitter is like this seems kind of odd, you know? Because Twitter, they're known like being accessible sometimes, but but I mean, there are there's good conversations on there, but sometimes it's hard to get through the noise, and it's like the one HR uses like S the Sherm Next chats on there, you know, the weekly live chat they do, you know? Why Twitter? How did that come about? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so uh, I have been a part of the HR Twitter community for at least the past 11 years. And um, a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but many voices that you see today um, that are successful, that people think are like overnight celebrities or overnight influencers, we were all, you know, having those conversations when Twitter first started and um, in Twitter's infancy. Um, why Twitter? I, I think it's a place where you can have real time conversation with a large group of people. I, I equate it to, uh, you know, in high school, when you went to the cafeteria and you sat at a lunch table, uh, 
Twitter is the social media platform where there's all these different lunch tables and you have the ability to like sit at whichever one you want and start talking in whatever one you want. So um, it, it's a very conversational, uh, the barrier to entry is very low. Uh, people who have public accounts, you can see what they say, you can respond to them and they can respond to you. And uh, there is a lot of noise on there, but what I do as a trick is there are literally voices that I, I follow on purpose. I mean, like I have followers and I have people that um, I follow, but the voices I really pay attention to, I'll go in, I'll hit an alert on their account and I'll, it'll say like, ping my, um, ping my watch or ping my, um, my iPhone when they tweet. And so that's kind of how I get through all the noise is like, I may be having ongoing conversations with maybe five to 10 people even though I have like maybe 5,000 people that I, that I follow and, you know, 6,000 people that follow me. So if you want to get through the noise, find the people you really want to hear from and, and get alerts when they post, or yeah. you can create, you can create lists too. You can create a list and only I, go I, to that. I need, I need to do that. I have lists. I need, I need to do the notification thing. Haven't done that yet for some reason. There you go. They can get annoying sometimes, but you can also mute all of your uh, notifications too for a while. Yeah. So for social media, you're talking about how students should use it. So I'm going to follow up on that. So let's go back in time. It's November, 2019, December, 2019. You're a college senior, got some jobs lined up, you know, the family's going to come see you graduate and then boom, COVID-19 hits. Everything yeah. changes. No more job offers. Everything just the whole world is changed, right? What advice do you have these people who, who will be trying to find the first HR job? Well, the first thing I'll say is, um, you know, like I said earlier, I started my business in a recession. And I think if you can land an opportunity and if you can manage your finances, if you can um, live your life well in the midst of everything going wrong, um, I really do think that you will thrive when things balance back out and, and they get better. So I just want to um, sprinkle a little bit of uh Optimism first for those who lean into um, to discipline and uh, and um, you know making the most of what they do have in this season. Uh, as far as advice, practically speaking, there are still companies that are hiring. There is still um, money being exchanged from customer to business in various markets, and you just got to find the industry that's doing the most hiring. So I know that um, off the top of my head, a lot of these online learning uh, companies are hiring. Um, as we ramp back up in the different phases, I'm sure companies will, will, will open back up hiring, but check job sites, check with your local SHRM chapters, uh, check with your college career center, and not only see what jobs are out there, but see what relationships you can build as well, because um, back in when I was in, when I was employed, I rarely went to an interview where I didn't know someone already or that, um, I wasn't like chosen to, uh, to go and interview. And I don't say that to brag, but I say that to just say that most jobs are filled through referral. And so you want to build your network of people that can uh, help you land a job and don't be afraid to even lean on your parents' networks as well, because they may know some, some people that are working and can, can give you an opportunity. So uh, build your network and, uh, and be diligent. I also tell people in HR trying to find a job, I, I tell them, you know, don't try to find an HR job, find an industry you want to work on, work in and learn the industry from top to bottom and then find an HR job in, in the industry. Yeah, that's a good idea too, because if you, if, you ask, if you ask 10 HR professionals how they got their job, one of them will probably say, I went to school for it and I always knew it that I wanted to do it in my life at some point many folks who are in hr got there because of a career pivot so why not learn that industry and uh and be a game changer so joey we, we talked about this a little bit but what's your take your take or opinion on the state of the the current state of the hr profession well the current state of the hr profession um i kind of hinted at it earlier where i think that hr in general is uh in an identity crisis I think a lot of HR conversations are um, conversations within an HR bubble in the sense that, you know, we have really good thought leadership, really good conversations, but 
are we really piercing the veil and flowing into um, how executives lead, how um, CFOs manage numbers, how marketing profession professionals develop their brand, how IT people account for um, you know the way employees and customers use use technology. Um, I think we're on the cusp of, of that changing and there being more people listening to uh, HR and, and using HR as a way to um, better the organization at large. But I think we're still in a place where we're all kind of just talking in a bubble and, um, and uh, it, it helps us as HR pros be better at what we do. But I'd love to see the day where, you know, um, I don't know, take the CEO of, of Google shows up to an HR conference because he wants to learn the best HR or the CEO of uh, what's a brand on my desk, um, Stream Deck or Apple or Logitech or whatever. Like they're showing up to HR conferences because they want to become better at what they do. So Joey, um, the Society, Society Human Resource, Resource Management, SHRM, they're like the big HR organizations, the Sky, the HR leaders, whatever. Do you think they're doing a good enough job of leading HR into the, into the, into the, into the future? How do you see, how do you think they can improve or are they doing pretty good in your, your, your point, from your point of view? Well, you know, I, I think the organization is so big that I don't have a, um, an accurate grasp into everything that they're doing. Uh, so I couldn't give like a, a total grade. Um, I do think that they could have responded a little bit better in light of uh, George Floyd and, um, taking a, a better stand against, uh, against racism and police brutality. Uh, I don't think that that was handled as best as it could. Um, but I, I do see what they're doing as in far as creating their own certification, having multiple tiers. Uh, I see them on, you know, the business, uh, cable networks. You know, I see, I see Johnny on, uh, on the television networks. Um, so I think that there is a longer term strategy of making HR relevant across business, but I, I, uh, I can't say that it's been, um, all handled, all handled well. Okay. Let's, let's talk about your podcast. Now, like mine, people say I have an HR podcast, like, no, it's actually a business podcast. I believe yours is more of a business podcast, but it's HR podcast, correct? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Yep. So how do your idea come about for doing this business business podcast? Was it like do marketing for your company or something you just want to do for fun or put your, get your, put your name out there? How did it all come about? Yeah. So the idea for the podcast started, um, I was listening for a long time to some podcasts and then um, some friends of mine did, did a movie review podcast and I can't remember the name now, but it was one of those things where it's like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And not in a competition way, but like, as an encouragement way of, Hey, I can step out there. I can get my voice, you know, for thousands to hear and, uh, make fun of or not learn something or not give a five star review or not, you know? Um, but, but why did I start it? And why is it called business life and coffee? I think of all of the conversations that have helped move my business forward that have helped shape me the mentor conversations that I've had and 99% of them have happened in a coffee shop or a Panera or some kind of setting like that, where the whole purpose is to uh, fuel the community through coffee, but also, also through helpful conversation. So every week on the show, I just try to create an environment where it's like you're having coffee with an expert or you're having coffee at a table where Jason and I are talking and it's up to both of us to, you know, ha uh, answer and ask questions in a way that fulfills the listener. Um, and now the viewer, since we've transitioned onto, onto YouTube and we have some other video stuff in the works. So it's, it's for the, the primary audience would be for early stage entrepreneurs. But of course, uh, people can gather and glean from it who are in HR, who are business professionals and who just, you know, want to want to learn something. So I listened to your last one you did. It was released on Tuesday. You talked to Russell Bronson of ClickFunnels. Yeah. So I guess ask, I get this asked ask us all the time. So I'm going to ask you, Jason, how do you get such great guests? My answer is, well, I asked, right? Or you can do say <laughs> no. Is that the same method you use to your guests or how do you get your guests? 
Yeah. So, so th there's a few, there's a few levels, right? So on one hand, yeah, it's ask a guest. Um, another hand is, um, and, and what happens often with my show is that I've had my show for five years. And when we started, it was on the, um, you know, new and noteworthy for uh, iTunes. But that was before there was like a thousand business uh, podcasts launching every day. Um, but through word of mouth, through reviews, through Google searches, SEO, all that stuff, um, my show has a certain level of vis visibility. And so I'll even have people reaching out either through themselves or through their, um, through their their PR firms and, and they want to come on the show. So I've had some really fun guests like uh, Anton Crowley from, uh, from Dropship Nation. Um, I asked my friend Ashley Graham, who is a, a, a model and body activist. Uh, she came on the show when she was uh, launching her book. And um, sometimes it's asked, sometimes people are, are trying to get on the show. But either way, it's kind of humbling that people want to have conversations with me when people first started asking me on my podcast, I was like blown away. Like, wait, what? You want to be on my podcast? Like, what? Well, you know? Didn't I ask you if I could be on your podcast? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, you made it in the podcast world when Jerry Price asked you to be in your podcast. Oh, uh, no way, man! No way, no way. I'm so I'm uh, I'm, I'm a low man on the totem pole still. <laughs> kind of off the topic, but what do you think about Joe Rogan's hundred million dollar deal with Spotify for exclusive podcasting on Spotify? All right, here's where we're talking business. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I think um, all podcasters should take note of what's happening with Joe Rogan and uh, see him as a, a pioneer in business because um, one of the podcasters I listen to is, uh, it, well, media personalities, uh, Charlamagne Dodd. And uh, he talks a lot about some of the business things on um, his show, Brilliant Idiots. Now they, they, they say a lot of controversial stuff, so this isn't an endorsement necessarily. But uh, he talked about the Joe Rogan um, thing and he was like, you know, he's doing this deal with Spotify, but he's still owning his content. He's just leasing out the exclusive right for them to promote it and, and, um, and, and use the show for three years. And then once that three years is over, he can either pull it back or they can continue and keep going. So I think it's, it's great for the podcast space. I think it adds legitimacy to podcasting in general as a medium. And I'm like, hey, man, get paid because that means other people are going to take notice. And, you know, maybe Jason has, you know, the exclusive, you know, uh, Amazon podcast or I have the exclusive, you know, um, title, you know, podcast, right? The, the industry of podcasting is changing because, Every day, every month, every year, it gets more and more legitimate as a as a means to um, to inform and entertain people. So I'm a, I'm a fan of it. Joey, from your time doing HR and being a CEO of Jumpstart HR, what are small business owners and founders consistently getting wrong about HR? Ooh, uh, they feel like they can do it themselves, and they feel like they can do it themselves, and that's what leads them to pick up the phone and call me because they've done it themselves and gotten in trouble. Um, so just thinking that they can take a, a profession, an industry, something that people go to school for and get really, really smart at, and they, they think that they can do it on their own. Um, another thing that they get wrong is um, um, compensation, um, you know, paying people fairly. Uh, they underestimate the value that their employees place in having HR because you got to think about it. You may have a small business, but you know, if I hired John from Coca-Cola, he's going to expect that there's a certain level of HR, that there's a certain level of benefits, that there's a certain way that you uh, have structure and order uh, with HR. So um, thinking they could do it themselves, and um, thinking that they can um, undervalue the expectations that their employees have about needing and wanting good HR. So Joey, on your entrepreneurial journey, can you talk about something that happened that you did not expect? And it can be something good on your journey or something bad that happened on your entrepreneurial journey that you did not expect when you first started. I, I didn't expect to be on your show, man. <laughs> <laughs> good one. <laughs> 
Uh, there's, there's been a few things, um, a few, a few humbling things. Um, some of the, uh, brands that I've been able to work with, uh, uh, at, from an HR perspective and, you know, like, uh, there's a, a New York times bestselling author, um, uh, in leadership and HR, his name is Kevin Cruz. And I call him my mentor from afar, but you know, he hired my company to do an employee handbook for, for one of his businesses. And so to have someone at that level say, hey, Joey, I trust your business with, uh, with my business, you know, that, that said a lot. Um, to be able to travel and speak um, across the country and now across the world. Uh, in, in November, I was in uh, Europe, um, uh, in Bulgaria, uh, speaking to a sold out crowd of 150 HR professionals. I did a keynote there. Um, so I never expected you know, the, the, the kid who grew up, you know, in Maryland to go across the a pond and uh, tell people how to do their HR the right way. Um, and then just, you know, having a team, you know, that, that, that was never really, you know, part of the picture. I just wanted to start a business for, for freedom and flexibility, but now having a team of people that I'm accountable to that, uh, that I get to coach and mentor and build into, um, I never would have, expected that joey uh, are you still a spokesman with for southwest airlines uh yes um not a, the, the my storyteller role with them um we don't do the storytellers anymore right now but there are still some things that i do with them that uh that i i get excited about so for example i think um i'll be attending a greater urban league event and I get to go as an ambassador of Southwest. So uh, we still have a, a relationship. It's, it's pretty cool. So next, Joey, talk about why HR is important to small business or startups. HR is important to small businesses and startups because the most important asset in your business is the team that you, that you gather. Or, well, let me say it this way. The team that you attract, gather, retain, and grow. Uh, you don't get the best product ideas if you don't have the best people working for you. You don't get the best, uh, you know, attention to customer service without the best employees working for you. You don't get, you know, um, to, to be able to take a vacation, <laughs> if I could be honest, if you don't have the best people working for you and you don't feel paranoid that uh, something bad is going to happen. So, um you need to develop and invest in your people if you want to see your business succeed year over year. Uh, we look at, you know, Inc. 5000 winners. We look at best place to work winners. We look at uh, Forbes list and um, a, a unifying thread is their attention and focus to, on their people. Um, whether that's through a defined HR department or just a commitment to the humans in your business. Um, if you're, if you're wondering what your uh, Achilles heel is because you can't grow and you can't seem to, to uh, grow to, at to a level you want, you're probably overlooking the importance of HR. Joey, understand you have something for our listeners today. Yeah, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Jason and I and you want to learn more about HR and what uh, Jumpstart HR can do for your business, you can go ahead and go to jumpstart-hr.com slash contact, and you'll be able to schedule a free 15-minute consultation. Uh, you'll talk with me. We'll understand what your business needs are. We'll get a game plan together, and we'll help you grow. So that's jumpstart-hr.com slash contact, and you'll get a free 15-minute consultation with me. Joey, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? I sure can, man. And again, Jason, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, I can be reached at Joey V price HR on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find me on LinkedIn at, uh, just search for Joey price. Uh, probably the only HR Joey price on there. Um, and then for jumpstart, it's jumpstart HR, all one word on Twitter and Instagram. We have a Facebook page as well. And you can find us at, uh, jumpstart hr.com. And if you're a link tree and you want to like a link tree person and you want to see all my handles at once, you can go to 
l i n k t r dot e e slash joey v price hr you can check out the business life and coffee podcast wherever you consume podcasts so link to the best if you're an entrepreneur and you don't know what Linktree is, I highly recommend you look up Linktree and use it. It's, it's just, it's the, it's the greatest. Yeah. Yeah. And for our listeners, we'll have the links to his, his gift and his social media on our show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshtlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your networks and friends. So Joey, we're coming into our talk. Can you provide us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Well, yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, um, while COVID has us sheltering in place and many people listening to this now will see a lot of the uh, limitations lifted off of where they live. But uh, even no matter where you are, if you're sheltering in place or if you're heading back into the office, you still have online um, to connect with people. So I encourage you to expand your network, meet someone new, set up a virtual coffee meeting, over Zoom or Skype or Hangout or whatever that may be and just find a way to build your network, learn something new and learn about someone new. That's my, my parting thought. Joey, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you being on my podcast. Hey man, thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well and remember to be great every day.